Hello, and thank you for taking a listen to Secure Insights with NDK Cyber. So today we're joined by Chris Pogue. Uh, Chris is a uh, director for CyberCX's Incident Response Division uh, for DFIR work. He has a background uh, as a CISO, as delivering work for other cybersecurity consultancies, uh, but also he reads or bridges the gap between the world of business and cybersecurity. So you'll learn more as you listen, but his journey has taken him from a cybersecurity practitioner, ex-military, right through to your more uh, business orientated roles, channels, alliances, speaking in those boardrooms with C-level professionals. He goes into detail about how uh, that journey came about for him, how he excelled in that space. And ultimately, if you wanted to do the same thing, the way you could uh, move in that direction. We also cover topics around the SEC's uh, new ruling, what that means for the incident response space, and uh, and how to really translate and really break down the walls, I guess, between uh, cybersecurity objectives and the objective of the business as well. So, hope you enjoy. Cool. Well, Chris, thank you for for jumping on and joining us today. Really appreciate it. Know you're a busy guy. Uh, so, I guess first things first. Uh, are you able to give a, a brief background of your uh, your experience today, what you've been doing, and uh, and what you're up to these days? Yeah, absolutely, James. And thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, so just a little bit of background on on me. I've been in uh, the cybersecurity space for about 25 years. Um, started my career uh, way back in the late 90s uh, in the United States Army, so mid-90s. Um, I, I was in the field artillery, which um, was super fun, making things go boom, but uh, not particularly um, – uh, transferable, right? Those skills weren't fungible. Uh, yeah. And so I reclassified into the U.S. Army Signal Corps and started working with computers on a professional basis, um, then got into cybersecurity in the very, very early days when it was just called information security. Um, I got a CISSP, uh, which is five digits, if that tells you anything about how old my certification is. Um, and then started working in a professional capacity as a pen tester uh, for IBM and then a forensics investigator. Uh, I was a much better uh, forensics investigator than pen tester, just wired a bit differently. And if you know the two types of people, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. And then have, have uh, kind of round peg, round hole from there um, with a, a detour a bit uh, to work with a software company uh, that, that makes, you know, forensic software and investigation software and then back into services in the last year with CyberCX. A lot of stuff crammed in there and uh, yeah, keen to dive into that in a bit more detail. And so uh, I, I guess then just plugging into, uh, I get the sort of the, the military piece, the transition there and uh, and the years thereafter. Um, you, you talked about it there or touched on it rather, the, uh, the software organization that's slightly maybe different to the other work you've been doing. How did that all come to be? Um, yeah, so I worked at Newix, uh, which is based in Sydney, uh, Australia. Um, and, and I worked there for almost nine years. Um, and, and what happened, I was recruited uh, over to Nuix to help build out um, their investigation capabilities within their software because I had a lot of practical knowledge about how investigations were run. Um, and, and so I spent a number of years doing that. And then I, I held uh, some different positions within the organization. Um, I was the head of operations for a while. Um, I was the first CISO for the company. Uh, I ran IT. Uh, I ran channel and alliances. Um, and, and so it really rounded out my understanding of business. So like I had the services piece pretty well in hand. Like I understood how it worked and how it was bought and sold. Um, but I knew precious little about the rest of business. Um, and, and so I had pretty much a nine year uh, apprenticeship. Um, you know, I reported to the CEO, who's an amazing man, knew so much about business that, <clears throat> excuse me, that he was able to teach me, you know, all, all of the different aspects of it. Like, what is a go-to-market strategy? What is, you know, sales compensation plans? Um, how do we create strategic, uh, you know, direction for the company and then follow that up with tactical execution? And and sort of all of those things um, kind of brought me to the place I am now, which is really having a much broader understanding of business, not just the services delivery piece or the security piece, which then helps me to advise my clients a bit more uh, and a bit more effectively because I've been in their shoes and I kind of have a better idea of the outcomes that they're looking for, not just the, the services that I want to sell them. 
And when you join those guys, then as, as their initial CISO to, to build out their practice and, uh, and clearly did well, got that off the ground. When you joined, was it sort of written in the stars in a way to take on these more alliances and uh, sort of more business-like roles? The CEO had that in mind. Um, I didn't have that in mind. Like I didn't even know, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so, you know, running sales through the channel, like it's never even been on my radar because I was such a security geek and a, a technology geek that 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 was just a that was a bridge so far away from my core competency that it didn't even seem like something I would ever approach. And and the CEO sat me down one day and he just said, look, you're just capable of more. He's like, I've been around a long time. I've worked with a lot of different people. I, I see capability in you that it's not that it's being wasted here. It can just be applied to so many other areas. And, and so he was the one that intentionally would move me every two to three years to a different role. Um, I would learn that role. I'd become proficient at it. And he'd say, great, good job. I want you to hand that to someone else. I've got something else that I'd like you to do. And, and so in doing that, I learned so many different pieces of the business that, and, and I also learned that I can learn anything, right? You kind of are afraid of the unknown. Um, you know, I, I was a security guy in a room with finance. I don't speak finance. I don't understand EBITDA and, and you, know, un, un, you know, those sorts of things. But as I held those more senior roles, I learned that you can learn just about anything, right? You might not be comfortable with it and you don't necessarily have a love for it, but you can learn it. And, and so it, it kind of brought me on that journey to realize that so much of business, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's just you got to take the time to read about it and research and study and understand it and then ask some questions. And then, you know, okay, it's not, it's not anywhere near as complicated as you might think it is. No, I've heard other people talk about it as it's all problem solving at the end of the day. And if you combine that with some good soft skills and speak to the right people and ask the right questions... The whole yeah. picture knits together. Would you say that's a fair well, and, view? Yeah, I do. And and when I would look at why I enjoyed it so much, it's it's that exact point, James, which was it's problem solving. And that's what I like the most about forensics is every time you walk into a new case, it's a different problem. And you know, you got to figure out how you're gonna solve it, put all the pieces together, tell the story. But any business problem is the same. Right. Whether you're figuring out, you know, how do I increase pipeline or you're figuring out how do I you know, increase collaboration with my channel, or you're figuring out, like, how do I get more feedback from my customers to, uh, you know, help inform my roadmap? It's all the same stuff. It's the same skills you apply. You just have to figure out, okay, what is the question I'm really trying to answer here? And what's the information I need to answer that question? And then where do I go find that information? That is exactly the same process that you follow during a forensics investigation. Like, what did the customer call me and ask me in, to define for them or figure out for them or you know, uh, in, investigate this breach or this incident? Well, what information do I need that's gonna inform me about what happened and when it happened and how it happened and how long it's going on? And then what information do I need to go, uh, excuse me, then where does that information live that I can go get it that will enable me to build that story of, of what actually took place? So it's, it's, it's all really, really similar. Yeah, I see. And I'm just thinking for those listening that might be thinking, okay, you know, I've I've been in technical roles. I've sort of led teams in this division. I've, I've delivered on the technical services in my organization. I'm really interested in getting into more of a business, you know, facing role, uh, a business style role. You mentioned there that your former CEO was you know, kind enough to sort of take you under his wing and sort of develop you and spotted roles that could suit you. Is there any advice you'd give to people that are looking to make that move at all? Is there anything you did or maybe even a trait that the CEO went, you know what, Chris is really good at X. That's why you're in these yeah. positions. Yeah, I think the the first thing is resilience, right? Is is being okay not knowing things, being okay um, being uncomfortable um, and, and not seeing that in any sort of negative light, right? So when he would put me in new positions, you know, like when I started reading, uh, excuse me, leading the alliances, right? Strategic alliances for the company, I had no idea what that even meant. And so he would say, look, you're a smart guy, go figure it out. And, and so that trait of there's information out there, you just have to go find it. And so I found the 
you know, there's an association of strategic alliance professionals. They have a reading list. Um, they have their own manuals, right? And so then you start, you know, researching Harvard Business Review or Forrester or Gartner and finding articles that you can read about successful alliances and failed alliances. And I mean, there's this mountain um, of information that you just have to go looking for and, and suddenly it's there. And, and so um, that trait, I, I think is super important, being okay um, on that learning curve and, and, and realizing that you're not going to be, you know, at, at cruising altitude, you know, right away and, and having the runway to be able to, um, you know, to get up to that point, to ask questions, to be okay, you know, failing. And, and because you look at the outcome that you want, where it's not proficiency on day one, but you, you know, realize, okay, I'll be good at this in a year or 18 months. And, and having an employer that's okay with that, right? Because there's a cost benefit, uh, you know, if it's a position within the company that they need someone to be, you know, uh, effective on day one, well, then putting someone in that position where they're going to have that learning curve, it, it's just not viable. But if you can afford to um, allow someone within the company to acquire those new skills and apply them because they have the other traits that you want, right? Those intangibles of, of, you know, they're, they're on time. They're, you know, they're dedicated. They're, they're trustworthy. Um, they get along with the other kitties in the sandbox, right? All of those other things that might not be, um, you know, directly in, uh, uh, related to the, to the job function, but they're tangentially related. And so, that's what he was able to do is is to spot those things. So I think all of those those traits and skills combined put me in the position where I could consistently learn and grow and improve and then move on, right? And so what happens at the end of nine years is I look backwards and I'm like, I know how to do all these things now. I know how to run a support team. I know how to run a training team. I know how to run global operations. I know how to run the channel. I know how to be a CISO. I know how to be the head of IT because I did each one of those things along the way. And as I gained proficiency, he would say, great, go find someone else to do that job now and you move on to the next thing. And so then I oversaw the person that was running it because I just spent you know two years building it. Of course, of course. It's all clearly paid off. And I'm not sure there was a bit of pushback initially when you stepped into these new roles of from people sort of pushing back and going, well, oh, Chris is just the cyber guy coming over and now he's sort of having a go at this. But like you say, looking back on those nine years, you've accomplished an awful lot and it's clearly paid off into what you're doing now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the role you're in now, director with this cyber firm here, what, what was sort of the, I guess, the, in a nutshell, what you're doing at the moment? Um, yeah, so exactly like you said, I'm the director of digital forensics and incident response for the US, um, which is great if all I had to do was run a practice of, you know, forensics investigators and responders that I've done that job before and I'm reasonably good at it. And so uh, that's great. Uh, a problem with that is uh, because CyberCX is located in Australia, right, that's where the majority of our market share is. That's the, where the majority of our our um, employees are. And, and so we're just now beginning the expansion in the last probably two years into the US and UK. Uh, and so that multitude of skills that I built, you know, during my tenure at Newix is now directly applicable, because I'm doing all of those things at CyberCX uh, to build the business in the US. So we have to work with, you know, alliances, and we don't have an alliance manager. So someone has to wear that hat. Um, we all have to sell. Um, because we have a very small sales team, and and so we have to take on that responsibility, which means we have to dictate our own operational tempos. We have to set, you know, our you know, our sales targets to be able to meet our you know annual operating budgets, right? All of those those sorts of things are now part of that job, and and so it's not it's not just doing the deeper piece, but it's looking at how do all of the pieces fit together that will allow the organization to be successful in the United States. And that, I, th I think that's a very, very different set of skills. Um, I mean, I have friends that run other deeper teams. And when I talk to them about like, I have to do sales calls. I have to work on, you know, my P and L. Um, I have to give briefings to um, the sales teams or to partner organizations. And they're like, why do you do all that stuff? <laughs> well, that's, you know, when when you're in a a, a pseudo startup company, um, you you got to wear a lot of hats. 
And if you've done those rules before, it makes it so much easier because you know what to expect. And, you know, you kind of know, all right, well, I have to do these things and I have to call these people and I've got to act like this. And it, it, it makes it a bit, um, a, a bit more seamless. Yeah, exactly. I, I can imagine it's far more easy to join the dots if you know what dots you're trying to join uh, rather than uh, trial and error, learning by uh, learning by failure, however you want to term it. And that, uh, that term you mentioned earlier, resilience, I'm sure uh, comes into this in an enormous hmm. fashion. So um, incident response then, it's it, it's a growing industry. We, we know that it's it's really in demand at the moment. There's a lot of organisations getting involved in this now. Um, and then I think the SEC changes uh, came into effect October, I believe. Uh, November, or excuse November. me, December. December, December sorry. December. Um, so these changes have somewhat influenced the incident response space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, and I actually wrote a blog post about this. If you want to go read about it on the CyberCX blog, you can. Yeah, um, share it but, the, uh, on the link. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the, 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 you know, the TLDR version of this is, is basically um, that the SEC says unless there's a material um, impact to, you know, national security or, you know, threat of, um, you know, threat to, um, you know, life and limb, you have four days to report an incident once materiality has been determined. And so then the question is, okay, well, what's materiality? Because uh, yeah. if you look at the 8K filing um, from, you know, MGM, for example, after their breach, you know, I think they estimated it was something like $110 million was going to be the impact, and they didn't determine that to be material. And so what's material to MGM might not be, or is not material to MGM, is material to, you know, Billy Bob's barbecue or, you know, whatever. And, and so... You can look to the uh, Supreme Court, right? So there's a, a, a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. The exact, you know, citation is in my blog post, but it, it basically says, look, if a reasonable shareholder would um, view this information as pertinent to the decision-making process to buy or sell, it is then determined to be material, um, which again, sort of nebulous, but but much more descriptive than, you know, just simply, uh, you know, everyone uh, you know, applying their own lens of what materiality is. Yeah, and so once that's, homework, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, right. So once you determine materiality, you have four days to report unless, you know, you're working with some law enforcement agency because there's a nexus to national security or threat to life and limb. Um, and, but what you also have to report then is the status of your cybersecurity posture. Um, and that's really where organizations get, uh, are starting to get hung up is they have to disclose this now. Um, and what is going to be considered, you know, quote unquote reasonable, right. In, in the legal ecosystem this is called a defensible position of reasonableness right and so one of my one of my side hustles is i'm a expert witness uh, both at the state and federal level and so i get to go to court and argue these sorts of things to determine is the actions that this individual took or this security team took deemed to be reasonable um, and there's a lot of opinion and speculation in that and so it's kind of the battle of the experts in the in the courtroom but the sec ruling should really put everyone on notice that you can't not report now, especially if you're a, a publicly traded entity, but this also filters filters down to non-public companies. So it's, 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 a, it's a much broader application because if you are a non-public entity doing business with a publicly traded company, you now fall under a whole litany of auspices that are uh, defined by the SEC. Um, also, there was a precedent set uh, last year where an organization, and this is in my blog post as well, but an organization violated the Dodd-Frank whistleblower program that the SEC deemed to be appropriate for you know, organizations or people that want to blow the whistle. Um, and because they violated that, the SEC fined them $250,000 or something like that, um, which, but they're not a publicly traded company. They just violated an SEC ruling. And so what everyone's kind of holding their breath wondering is how broad is the SEC going to apply this rule? Is it just going to be publicly traded companies? Is it privately held companies that do business with publicly traded companies? Or is it going to be everybody? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the size of the tin star that they pinned on is, I think, is still to be determined. Um, but fascinating. In addition to that, now you have the recent 
um, charges that were brought by the SEC against Solar Winds, uh, which is I, again I wrote another blog post about. It's being edited right now, mm -hmm. but the whole concept of that is not, you know, did the CISO inherit, you know, a, a poorly secured infrastructure and do his darndest to make things better. And then this happened as a result of that. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's the case. We're going to assume positive intent and say that it was. Mm -hmm. But the real crux of the issue, when you start to peel back and you read the charges, it has to do with um, not reporting. Mm -hmm. And so or being disingenuous in your reporting. Right. So if you kind of look at what, you know, Kenneth Lay and, and, and Jeffrey Skelling got dinged with um, from Enron, it was failure to report, right? You have to be honest and forthcoming in your, you know, reportings to the SEC. And it doesn't, you know, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what they are, but you certainly can't lie. And and so when you look at the charges from, um, uh, that were brought against SolarWinds, that is the crux of them, is not that their security wasn't good. This isn't a um, an indictment of their you know, security posture, but it's a indictment of, we think you knew better. We think you intentionally misled us, which then led to, you know, a investor or a shareholder, you know, investing monies uh, in your company under false pretenses. And so how that shakes out, I, I think is going to be really interesting as well. So this whole SEC landscape is, is, a really interesting approach. It's going to have a material impact, I believe, on the industry. But I think there's there's still some some TBD into what that's actually going to play out and look like. Yeah, I got you. I got you. And and the way I sort of understood it was that you know it's to to really put a stop to these instances without naming any names where you might have an incident and report it as a bug bounty program or something like that. And it, it makes perfect sense uh, yeah, from from what I said anyway. But what you were, what you were mentioning there around if you're a, a private company supplying into the a public company, you can still get dinged and you're still under the jurisdiction to a degree. Yeah. 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 Wow. Absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, that's why, you know, I, when, when we wrote this blog post, it's, it's basically like a two part series that says, look, if you're a privately held company, don't think the SEC ruling doesn't apply to you because it probably does. Um, so really interesting read. I encourage people to go read it and, you know, let me know what you think. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll chuck a link under the, uh, under the link to the episode for sure. So from an incident response perspective, Mm -hmm. How has that influenced, I guess, your space with these new rulings coming in? Has that sort of created more business opportunities or a bit of a confusion? Or how has that linked into what you do? Yeah, I, I would think it's going to create more opportunity because anytime, you know, there's a joke, right? Legislators going to legislate. <laughs> so anytime there's an increased body of legislation or enhancements to an existing body of legislation, right? Then there's a requirement for P for organizations and people to conform, right? To whatever those pieces of legislation are. And, and so I think this is going to do a couple of things. I think we're going to see more um, activity in the incident response space because we are subject matter experts. Like lots of organizations that I've worked with over the years um, have internal IR teams. And, and some of those teams are led by really smart you know, guys and gals who are really good at their jobs. Um, but as you said, you're checking your own homework at that point. So the benefit of having a third party come in, even if it's to you know, collaborate with the internal teams is, is gonna become increasingly important. A, because um, of our perspective of, um, uh, of of not being biased, right, or impartiality. And, and I think in addition, though, it's the broad spectrum of information that we have because of the number of cases that we work, right? I mean, I've worked, I don't know, 3,000 cases across my 25 years, uh, across, you know, a number of verticals, businesses that are Fortune 50 companies and businesses that are small mom and pops. Like we see a lot. And so having that information available to these organizations, it's, it's I, I think it's an untapped benefit that how do companies my size do it? How do companies in my vertical do it? What are other companies doing that I should be doing? Where have you seen organizations fall down? Where have you seen organizations really stand up? So organizations that, that work with a, a, a third-party service provider get the benefits of that breadth of, of experience and that visibility that they've had. And it's not that their internal teams 
don't have a, a important part to play and a, and a really viable lens. I mean, they know their organizations better than anyone, um, but their lens is restricted just to what they know. And, and so while I may not have the depth of understanding in the individual organization, I've got a really wide breadth uh, across lots of organizations. So I think that's one thing you're going to see is more involvement um, with organizations that need third-party expertise. Uh, and I think the other part of that is the preventative piece. Um, you know, in the past, security, and I've, I've struggled with this when I was a CISO, is a bit of a, look, we'll spend money if we have to, but if we don't have to, we're not going to. And and so engaging, you know, a, a, a third-party security team is something that you'll do when and if that day comes. And But then the question asked, well, is that reasonable? And and I, you know, I think the resounding answer is no. Um, engaging early on helps you, I still have all the same lessons learned, right? I still have 25 years worth of cases under my belt that I can bring, you know, here's what worked, here's what didn't, right, into the organization. But then we can proactively look at how do we implement some changes to make it easier to respond, to allow you to respond faster and more comprehensively to be able to meet these increasing demands that the government or regulatory bodies are putting on businesses to report in a timely manner, right? All of them have some sort of time frame on them, whether it's, you know, the individual reporting, you know, pieces of legislation state by state in the U.S., whether it's GDPR or LGPD or, you know, uh, the Australian um, APP, right? All of them have a time limit. And so, the better you are at responding, the easier it is to hit those those time limits and you can do that with an increased amount of, of information that's higher fidelity and you're not you know, guessing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're going to see a shift there with organizations being a bit more proactive and not necessarily relying exclusively on their own internal teams because those third party uh, do those third parties do provide that that wider breadth of understanding. Understood, understood. So yeah, like, like you say, it's certainly no slant to your internal team or it's not a you're not good enough factor. It's just a factor of we've got a second set of eyes, if you like. We've got external expertise, completely impartial. Yeah. And also, you know, we, we want to get the reporting right, I guess. Okay. Yeah, well, look at, at I mean, pick any professional athlete, right? It, it doesn't matter what sport. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll say Michael Jordan because I'm old and he was one of my favorites growing up. And I read the books that his personal trainer, Tim Grover, wrote. Okay. And and so Michael Jordan was an amazing athlete, easily considered, you know, the greatest basketball player that's ever lived. Um, but his raw talent was only part of the equation, right? He had a personal trainer. He had coaches that worked with him on shooting and conditioning and strength. And he had a dietitian and he had you know, a, a sports psychologist, like all of these people collaborated around him to make him, you know, the, the you know, the greatest basketball player that's ever lived. And so it's, it's a very similar approach. It's, it's not that an internal team doesn't have talented people that know exactly what they're doing, that are trained and educated and really good at their jobs. But just like Michael Jordan had a, a cadre of, of experts around him to help him get that much better, that's what we're looking at here is an external team can help you get that much better. External crisis comms helps you get that much better. Outside legal counsel helps you get that much better. And in a lot of these breaches that I've worked, right, there's a huge percentage that aren't these egregious you know, violations of security best practices. It's like – it's a game of inches like you miss one patch or one person clicks on an email you've got you know phishing campaigns and you work with training and you have cybersecurity awareness programs and it's one person that clicks on a link and you get you know smoked by you know, like medusa or something um and and so there's there's something to be said again from that defensible position of reasonableness to say we have an internal team we do training and education we work with third parties that are experts in each of these individual areas that come in and that train us and lead us and guide us and help us to get better in those particular areas and we still got hit like what else could we possibly be do doing uh, I, I think it's a much stronger argument than like ah, we handle everything internally and we got hit and the scissors head needs to roll Right. I think that's an antiquated approach that I just don't think is going to fly anymore uh, in lieu of the SEC rulings, as well as, you know, I think public opinion and, and brand damage and reputation and, and corporate risk and right of all the things that go with that.
Yeah, I think you're right. I think just from our perspective as well, we tend to see, uh, we have a pretty good finger on the pulse of what's going on and what's growing and what's what's hitting. And I think the incident response stuff has been growing for a while and maybe the SEC will, will catalyze that further. Uh, let, let's see and see how that, uh, that pans out. Um, mm. Now, Chris, we've, we've spoken before and uh, you mentioned uh, cyber McCarthyism. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of magic eight ball for me, right? Every, every so often I get asked, whether it's by my students. So I teach at Oklahoma State University as well. So I teach computer forensics and, and business there. So some of my students will ask me or I get asked at conferences, like, what do you see on the horizon? What's coming? And yeah. and so, you know, it's it's with an election year coming up next year um, and, and, you know, our previous experience with, uh, with interference, um, it, it kind of made me think about, you know, in the 19, what, I'm going to get this wrong, so we may have to fact check this. Uh, but I think in the 1940s and 50s, right, you had Senator Joseph McCarthy, who accused lots of people in the U.S. government of being communists. Well, some of them probably were, some of them probably weren't. Um, but it would it became rampant, right? And it became known as McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're going to see as part of this election cycle is any cyber thing that goes bump in the cyber night is going to be pinned on the Russians. Whether it is, whether it isn't, it's not going to matter. It is McCarthyism 2024 because we are going to see Russians in every email, in every you know message, in every deep fake. I mean, everything that could possibly go wrong and does go wrong, it's going to be the Russians' fault. Whether it is or it's not is irrelevant. And so what I think that is going to do for threat actors that aren't Russian, people like Anonymous Sudan or Revil or any of these threat actor groups that may not be associated with Russia or the Russian government, it's carte blanche for them. It, I mean, it's like, hey, we can attack the US all day. All we have to do is pull up a Tor node, get a Russian IP, and we're off to the races because everyone wants to see the Russians. Oh, it's their fault. Vladimir Putin's trying to you know, destabilize the democratic process. And, and so that's my prediction is we're going to see lots of activity. It is not all going to be the Russians, but we're going to blame the Russians for everything. And I think it gives a measure of, of um, uh, anonymity to other threat actor groups and hostile nation states that want to do harm to the U.S. and U.S. interests to, to kind of operate with impunity. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably going to lead to a rise of those non-Russian threat actors and, like you say, operating without the spotlight on them. Okay, concerning. So. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see where that uh, that pans out. And you mentioned there around the the professor work you do. How did you get into that world? Just out of interest. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was kind of by accident. My uh, <laughs> so my daughter's a, a sophomore at Oklahoma State University, and so during admitted freshman week, right? So all the admitted freshmen go to this this thing, and you go in in waves, right? There's like I don't know five thousand freshmen in her class, um, so it's quite large. But so anyways, so she wanted to study international business because she likes the work that I do. And so I just got to talking with the dean or the assistant dean at the time about, you know, what I did. And so she introduced me to the head of the MSIS department, who then said, wow, have you ever thought about teaching? And I said, well, I used to actually teach in the Secret Service. Um, I, I taught at you know Southern Utah University. So, yes, I've, I've taught before. And they said, well, how would you like to come teach for us? And because the computer forensics class that they had was being taught by a PhD student who graduated and they didn't have anyone teaching it. And so I said, sure. And so I started teaching that class about two years ago. And then after the first semester, um, the head of the international business school came to me and said, hey, you know, we heard you're doing a good job. We know that you work in Australia. You've got some experience with international business. Would you like to teach this class for us? So I, I talked to my boss. He said, yeah, sure, as long as you don't take too much time away from work. Okay. And so I've been doing that now for two years. And uh, I just love it. Um, being able to take, you know, 25 years of experience and, and pour into the next generation and help these kids uh put themselves in a better position when they graduate, you know, stuff that took me 10 years to figure out, I get to teach to them now, right? Which is, I think is going to be really beneficial to the business world. And I just think it would be such a shame for, for, you know, folks, I'm 51. So, you know, people in business my age who have all that information in their heads, don't retire and just take that knowledge with you, right? Give back to the next generation and help them, you know, get better as a result of it. Um, and, and, you know, it's just been, it's been a great, 
uh, it's been a great experience for me. I love it and I want to keep doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, it's probably uh, probably really helpful for the students as well and not taking anything away from those that maybe haven't been in the field or been a practitioner, but to have someone that's been there and done it, I guess adds a, adds a real gravity to it too. Mm. And we, we bounced around a lot on this call from a, a few different areas, but I think a, a really common theme from, from your experience and what you do is, I guess, bridging the gap and maybe reducing the animosity between the business and cyber and working together rather than having two camps. Mm. And, and that's a challenge a lot of people have in whatever organization or environment they're in. Is there sort of maybe one or two lessons you've had from, or you, or you could pass on rather from reducing that animosity between the business and yeah. cyber security? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's really prominent. Like it's not just prominent in, in business, but like I teach in two different schools, right? They're all under the, what's called the Spears school of business, but the, so the school of MSIS or management science and information systems uh, and the school of marketing and international business, they're just two very, very different groups of kids. And so the MSIS students are technologists, like they're getting computer science degrees, uh, or data analytics degrees, like they are, they are wired differently than my students in my international business class who are studying marketing or, um, you know, enterprise management or human resource management or something like that. And so you, you play that out and it continues into the workplace. And right. It was almost like the, you know, the jocks versus nerds from high school is all the <laughs> tech people are all the, you know, the nerds from high school and all the, you know, sales and, and, you know, stuff like that are, are all, you know, athletes. And so it's, it's funny. It's, you know, I kind of say it tongue in cheek, but it, it really does play out like that. Mm -hmm. And, and so what, what we, what I've learned over the years is I speak a different language, right? When, when we start talking about technology and we start talking about security controls and countermeasures and threat actor groups, that is a different language that most CEOs, CFOs, um, you know, COOs, they just don't speak that language. Very, very smart men and women, just a different language. And so what I had to do was sit down with each of my counterparts on the executive team and learn their language. Like, tell me how to speak CFO. Um, what are the things that are important to you? What are you know the sorts of, of things that are important to the business from your perspective? And they all had their own you know unique perspective. So instead of trying to beat them in the head with cybersecurity is really important, and I'm going to shout louder like if I'm in a foreign country and want someone to understand my language, I <laughs> of course you know speaking louder and slower is is going to make them understand. And, and so that's kind of what we've been doing in the cyberspace for years is, you know, these things are important. You must, you know, spend money on firewalls and buy incident response retainers and stuff like that. Yeah. But we never learned the language of the target audience that we were speaking to. Like boards of directors don't care about firewall ACLs. They care about business reputation and they care about you know, the sustainability of the business and longevity of the business. And the CFO cares about EBITDA and he cares about profitability. They care about revenue numbers. What do our renewal rates look like? How are we handling customer acquisition costs, right? All those sorts of things. And, and so it wasn't until I learned their language that I was able to translate cybersecurity into CFO or CEO or board or whatever. So now when I talk to clients about their cybersecurity risk profile, I, I don't go into the minutia that they don't care about and don't understand anyways. But I go into, and this is how it affects corporate risk. This is how it affects your market cap. This is how it affects stock price. This is how it affects, you know, all of these other things that you do care about that are super important to you. And so I think as cybersecurity professionals, we collectively need to get better at understanding the language that our other executive brothers and sisters speak and what's important to them and why it's important to them so that we can then translate, okay, so from a security perspective, here is why we want to do these things because the things you have identified as strategically important for the business cannot be successfully done without these security pieces. Or from a risk profile, we are introducing significant risk to the business because of these things being lacking, because if something happens, it's, you know, we hit these, these reasons, protracted litigation, loss of customer confidence, loss of market share, whatever. And so they go, oh, I don't want any of those things. Great. 
here's what I need to do. And typically then the clients go, oh my gosh, yes, go do all those things mm -hmm. because we've been able to translate security controls and countermeasures into business outcomes, right? How do we make more money? How do we save money? Or how do we you know, prevent from future losses? And once those linguistic barriers have been, uh, have been, you know, breached or not breached have been, uh, you know, translated or, or down, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then you have a whole different set of conversations and that, that animosity starts to drop and it's much less a shouting contest and, and more of a support mechanism where, you know, the CISO can say, look, how can I help you get the business objectives that you want? And explain those to me and talk to me about why it's important. And so then I can go back and go, okay, well, these things that I had on the list really don't matter because they're not part of your objectives. But these things here, ooh, these really matter. So we need to prioritize these because they're the ones that are directly tied to the corporate objectives that, you know, that they're trying to achieve in the next fiscal year. Very well put. And I think there's a lot of people out there that could take uh, extraordinary value from that. And uh, I, I speak to a lot of people that are sort of on the edge of doing that, but aren't sure if that's the way to do it. And I think those people in particular will, will probably listen to that and go, you know what, I need to keep driving with with what I'm doing here and, and building those connections. And like you say, the terminology, breaking down the barrier or you know, changing up some yeah. linguistics, however you want to term it. Uh, I guess it's just about reducing that resistance you get you know, mm -hmm. uh, from the off. So. Yeah, and the onus is on us. Like it's been what twenty five years, thirty five years that security's been in, in in existence, and you know we sort of pat each other on the back and say we're doing a great job, but we're really not. Um, and and it's I think it's our own fault, right? We we get so narrowly focused on the security components of it, and not exclusively. I mean, there's 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 unicorns that are are able to make that that transition, but the more we can get in, into understanding the business, and and you know making them less, you know, the adversary as opposed to a collaborator. Um, I, I, I really think that's the key. And that really is up to us. Like you really, if you're a security professional listening to this, you really do have to go read about finance, right? Finance for the non-financial manager, great book. You really do have to read about boards of directors. So boards that lead, great book. You really do have to sit down with your CEO, um, read execution by Larry Bossidy and Ram Charan, right? Really dig into what's important to them. Why is it important to them? How does it affect the business? Then once you start to build a picture of what that means, then you can retroactively apply that to your security posture. And you can say, okay, CEO, or, you know, Mrs. Chairman of the board, here are the things from a security perspective that I think are important to support the objectives that you've already laid out. And that's, that's on us. It's not going to happen any other way. Love that. It's really tangible as well. The advice you've given there, and it's down to the nitty gritty details of, of of what book to read. And uh, and this this conversation, it's it's been almost an hour already, and we've gone in many different uh, places. And I think there's an awful lot of value in there for people to take. So so thank you so much for for taking the time there. Um, just before we wrap up, if people want to reach out, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can reach me at at, at Chris at cybercx.com, and I'll I'm, and, you know I'll make sure that James has the information we can put in there. Or I can also be reached at Christopher.pogue at oakstate.edu if you want my uh, my university email. But please, yeah, if you have any questions about what books to read, uh, how do we approach this? What do these conversation starters, you know, look like? Uh, I'm I'm happy, you know, to share. And if you want, you know, expertise and, and assistance, right? CyberCX has 1,400 security professionals around the world across 12 disciplines that are here standing by to help your organization in any capacity we can. Um, it's very bespoke offerings. We don't really have cuts, you know, it's not applications or, or firewalls that we're selling. We really are uh, using our expertise uh, to assist uh, in, in helping you to achieve whatever business outcomes you want. That's awesome. Well, Chris, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll wrap up here and uh, I'll be in touch soon. Yep, awesome. Thanks, James. Cheers, Chris.